So we're going to start the, the meeting today. We'll do a quick uh, round of introductions. Um, and I should announce I got a uh, communication from Director Green that he is uh, in the air right now and not able to participate. So um, yes, I gave him a quick snapshot of what we were going to do today, and I'll be brief when he gets back. Um, and so I think we should be OK. Um, but why don't we start, um, Roseanne, you're, you're in Rachel. Rachel Lent, I'm a paralegal in the general counsel's office. Roseanne, Paul board manager. Michelle Chess, um, our member. Our board you know, uh, here representing the office of teaching. Jackson Weinberg, student member to the board. Danny Cage, representative to the policy. Liz Large, uh, contracted general counsel. Claire Hertz, deputy superintendent. Mary Kane, senior legal counsel. Dan Young, chief operating officer. Aaron Preston, senior program manager of the new sustainability. Jonathan Garcia, chief staff. Shanice Clark, community engagement. Ailey Lowry, board member. Awesome. Uh, great. So today we have um, a number of items on our agenda, and actually there's only one that we're going to um, take specific action, but hopefully take action on, um, and that would be the um, student representative and district student council policy. Um, I um, am going to, uh, because this committee has been so efficient on our rescissions, I'm going to hold off just on the ones this time, just so we can focus really on work. I think I think we did good work in 2021 and cleared out a lot. So uh, we'll continue. 19. <laughs> so far. OK, there we go. And <laughs> hundreds of pages. Um, so we'll continue in 2022, 20, but just say we're not going to um, move any of them. And then um, let's see, uh, just so I can manage time. Um, how many people do we have signed up for public comment? One. One. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Because I'm going to, I'm striving for those people who got here a little later, I'm striving to end at um, 5.50. Sorry. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, no staff update on the space bargaining? No, they, they added sessions. Um, so there's no... I don't think there's a substantive update yet, but we continue to work on it. Okay, great. Um, I should also share one other thing before we dive into the next item. There, um, there's on the agenda, there's a new uh, number four, and there's nothing under it today, but just so people know, this is like a new agenda item category, which is legislative or regulatory required policy changes. So as things come through that are required by by law or statute or ODE, um, that's where they're going to go. That and that would be different from, say, um, the other items that we are currently working through, uh, because there are ones kind of like sort of required required changes. Um, so just look for that, and that they'll be all under those policies. All right. So we have. Can um, I ask about a question about that? That's not going to be an agenda item that will be active every time. It'll just be on it as needed. Right, so it's like a category, <laughs> you know, like rescissions are a category, it's just like, okay. Um, what I want people to do is be able to look at the agenda and know, like, why are we, why are we doing mm -hmm. these things? Um, and so that's, it's just a category and sometimes there'll be some things and I, um, there are some things that are going to be coming um, in this category that, I mean, this it's like the workplace harassment um, one that we worked on last time. And speaking of that, we can just get rid of another agenda item um, because we have policy number six is policies and public comment, and we have three policies in public comment, but they only went out public comment last night, so nothing to do with the report. Um, all right, so uh, the first uh, agenda item that we're going to dive into is the district student council policy, and. Um, we went through this pretty thoroughly. 
uh, at the last uh, community meeting. This is really focused on um, making some a narrow set of changes uh, prior to the elections uh, this spring for the student rep. We wanted to make sure that we worked out through our policy process uh, before uh, before we get to the elections process. And uh, I was invited to come um, speak to the district student council uh, a week ago or two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago and had a great discussion. Uh, I will say that nobody holds back their point of view or asks the tough questions. Uh, so we had, a, we had a good discussion. Um, Jackson or Danny, since you both were there, do you have anything you want to share or? Uh, um, I just felt like it was lovely. Also, now that after you visited, I was like, I think that we should yeah, I think whatever was more like questions instead of concerns. I don't care when we like strong concerns about it. It was more just like a question about how it was done. Yeah, it was a great discussion. I felt like, and I said, um, I didn't come off easy. Um, <laughs> And um, we talked about if people, if, if any of the student reps had, um, or the members of the council had issues they wanted to raise about the, the policy changes, that they'd have the opportunity to come now or any other time during the policy, the public comment process. So um, I think we went through it in, I think, pretty, um, pretty in a pretty detailed way. And um, I'd say since then, I haven't. Had any feedback from any of the members of the council on proposed changes? So I um, would like to ask the committee members and speak of you. Um, are there any discussion points or questions or concerns um, outstanding about the policy? Because otherwise, I am going to ask the committee if you're ready to move it, move it out of committee. Getting a thumbs up from the director Lowry. Thumbs up for me. Okay, so that, that's a thumbs up that we're ready to. No, no more questions. Um, so with that, uh, this is Director Constam. I wanted to ask some of the the students um, what the rationale was for including the language that allows for administrative appointment of a DSC. Representative, um, as opposed to uh, requiring an, a school wide election? I can't answer it, but I think. Okay. Yeah, so all these changes actually came from staff, but the rationale behind it was um, we didn't want students on the DSC to be treated to, based on how they got to the DSC. Um, and some schools don't have elections at all in their schools. So allowing that to be an alternative process for people to join the DSC and not like penalizing them for their school not having that process, basically. Or if there had been an interrupted service in the yeah. middle of a term, there had been an election, but then not, you know, someone left, moved, their family yeah. moved. It gave some flexibility without creating a lesser status of DSC representative. Yeah. Also, some high schools or alternative schools don't want to have elections either, so allowing that to yeah. <laughs> anything, anything? Thanks, Jackson. Okay, committee members, um, are you prepared to recommend that we move it to the full board for our first reading? I am. Great. Thank you. And thanks to staff for the great comments. Um, Danny, I think if you all invite. Um, I board members to come um, to the meeting. I'm sure people would be happy to, uh, like I said, there's some great questions and really good uh, discussion. I have never turned down an invitation. Yeah, I'm going to send out a schedule to students. <laughs> Keep hearing. Okay, um, so student rep policies. The climate crisis and policy. Um, I thought it would be, before we jump into the discussion, be worthwhile to have a, a little bit of a level setting. 
so that um, we all have an understanding of where we are in the process and what the documents are. I think uh, um, I've uh, described this at the, the early process um, as sort of like a little bit of a hairball. I mean, we had like six or seven different drafts. Um, we're really wanting to get everybody's um, input. Um, I appreciate also Aaron's um, work to solicit uh, staff input on the various versions. Um, and just in terms of full disclosure, I was on the committee, but the first 22 drafts, I wasn't on like the smaller task force that was put together. Um, so I know, I know there's been a lot of work on this, and I think we're getting close to a point in time um, where uh, we have the, the universe of information and we can draft. Um, so to me, I, I feel there's there's a path to um, getting a first re a first reading and uh, then a round of uh, public comment and adoption of the policy. So I just want to thank all like I know individual board members went through, uh, committee members went through and provided input, um, and then all of that we got staff feedback on um, and including feedback from the superintendent. So we are, I think, at a point in time where we're getting getting ready to, to, to move. Um, so we had a document that went from the previous uh, policy group that had several iterations. I think it was version 23. Then we had community engagement. We made some changes. And then we landed on version 25. Um, and how we're going to move going forward is that is going to be like the base, the base document. So from now on, it'll be version 25, you know, as amended, if we amended it today, for example, as amended on this information, instead of continuing on the version. So we have a base, we have a base document. Um, and I think it's important after last night to just um, clarify kind of where, where we are. So we're, so 25, version 25 is a base document and there have been suggestions to um, make additional changes, some pretty substantial ones, and also to, re, um, to, to take some portions out. And to be clear, those, that's, the, the committee hasn't taken any action on any of that. To this, to this point. So we, we still are, again, this is just a level setting. So we all, so we have all the same set of expectations. Um, so we are going to discuss those though. Um, but to this point, the sort of like things have been taken out or we've done something. Um, we have, we have a, we have some proposals to, to make some changes, but we're, we're <laughs> it's version 25. Um, so hopefully there will never be a version 26. It will be this version. We're all working on the same document and the things, I think, the additions and deletions and changes um, going forward. Uh, also posted today is a policy that's, I don't have the number, but it's sustainable business practices. And I'm having that posted because there are there are some common commonalities between that um, policy and things in this policy. In addition, we have posted today is a preamble, and I want to thank um, Chief Garcia and um, our two students on the committee for working on the preamble. This is something we discussed last time. And so that's that's posted as well, and we'll probably have just a high-level discussion of it uh, today. And um, as a reminder to people, the reason why we created a preamble is there was some discussion about um the community feedback that we had and engagement and that um we hadn't it, it was hard to capture some of the feedback in um in the policy and like in terms of actions and so this is really like the, the framing um a little bit of the framing of the policy and framing it through some of the, the lens of um our students and frontline communities um so thank you again for, for providing us with the draft 
And then the other, the other thing that's posted today is um, a document that's, um, and it, it's not a, a final version, but it's an example of how we might work through the, some proposed changes. And it's, I forget what, it's, what we labeled it, but it just has proposed amendments. And what I did is I took, um, just as a sample of how we might think about it, is the different sections of the policy and um, superintendent staff have proposed a number of changes that are in, in red line, which I'm appreciative because to me that's very clear of what we're doing, either adding or anything or changing. And by section, like those would be amendments. So if you take version 20, 25, and then um, you can look at the amendments and you can see, for example, like it says amendment number two, it's to goal one. You can see exactly what is being proposed to be changed, deleted, added. Um, and then a, a very important thing is at the end, there's some uh, footnotes and there's foot this up with a very short explanation um, about the, the change. So, in order for those to be included um, in the in version 25, um, we would be there would be committee agreement to amend. Oh God, does that um, make sense? So that would be how we would do that, and then. One other thing that I wanted to share today, and I'm going to ask um, Liz to um, polish it up if I don't get it quite right. Um, the original document that had, it was the color-coded one that had blue, green, and red um, that we saw a couple weeks ago, That's those are now, those changes are now that set of, amend the set, set of amendments. And when that originally was um, posted, on the red, it said something like proposed being delete, like deleted. And it had it for a variety of reasons, like it's not feasible or this is duplicative. So that's very clear going to be out of the policy. Um, and then there was another category of um, there were a lot of the deletions um, that said administrative directive or implementing plan. And before we get started considering anything, um, and then we got a little bit into this last night at the board meeting, but to be just crystal clear is um, people should think of that as um, that was an old document, and it's not the operative document. So right now, you should think of, um, when you look at these changes, um, it is not, um, it could be, but it may not be in an administrative directive or an implementing plan. The superintendent has said that he feels there's a high degree of alignment in terms of um, high level uh, direction with the policy language, but um, the, the things that are, that are being proposed to come out uh, may or may not be an administrative directive. Um, and I, I know that, um, I'll just speak for myself. As early on, when I looked at that document and it said administrative directive or implementing plan, I felt like, oh, if we took this out, it'll be somewhere else. And I think we should just all know it may be, but it may not be, or maybe in a slightly different form. Um, but keep, it, keep that in mind. Did I get did I get that right? I think or, so. With two small okay. corrections. Um, I think when you asked us to prepare this document, um, we also part of that exercise was to go through because I think the the document, the color coded document you're referring to, was pretty uniform in taking out. The content below the goals, color coding it for use elsewhere. Some of that has been revisited and revised. So this is not an exact adoption of that. In yeah. fact, some of it's been restored or merged or, and I don't want to, 
not in, in great numbers, but there's actually more in here than was in that we're proposing to stay. Um, and I do think there is, because uh, you and I were on the same call, you know, I mean, think a very <laughs> high level of um, alignment and wanting to be innovative and bold, but also wanting to be sure that the language that results um, in the policy can be understood and the expectations about what it means to achieve that are uh, are clear. And, and, then, and I do think you said it very well that, that some of the language coming out very, without a doubt, will end up in an EV or an implementing plan or some other document. But at this stage, staff thought that as we went down that path, because I think that was part of the original idea, obviously that's why it was in the document, it became, it, it wasn't a guarantee of the exact language as stated. And, and the, the risk of misrepresenting or being able to massage and fit in an AD development over time when the targets were set. Dan, I don't want to parody what we have talked about a lot, so let me not speak for you. But that's, I think, the, the idea it isn't to say, we're not going to do it and it's going to be going to screen. It's to say, to be fair, that hasn't been drafted yet. And this, we are developing these plans and they are moving over time to achieve the objectives that result in the policy and, and document work that's already in play. Yeah, and I, I think that's fair to say that when we say that it, it may move to an AD or it may move to an implementation plan and, it's, and it may not be the exact same language because it might be much more detailed. You know, we plan on going up and getting a greenhouse gas emissions analysis that will allow us to benchmark and to set specific goals. So, whereas the information we have now might say, you know, increase, uh, you know, electrical capacity to the extent feasible, our AD might say we want to increase our solar capacity by specific dates. So the intent is going to be there in some form. It's just means this way, you know, the AD is obviously a different document, so it have more details, would be more descriptive. Uh, and so we want to have that additional data so we can form that. But again, it's not going to be the same type of pace because we're going to have more information and we're going to be more descriptive of how we're going to be able to But we also need to be clear, there may be some things that aren't in there. Right. Okay. Because I think those are very important, like just sure. any expectations. Um, and there may be points in time when I or other committee members or community members ask, is this something that's just going to disappear? Mm -hmm. Um, and for that, like, for whatever reason, you don't feel it fits or something, something else. But, um, so I just wanted to do that level setting. Does anybody else have any questions about that? Will we go through the amendments and talk about them? Yeah, for sure. The, today, um, we've got two more things and then related to the climate, and then that's what we're going to do. Um, so everybody can kind of hear the thinking, the rationale. Is there an opportunity to, is, is version 25 it and there's no more comment taken or are there opportunities to contribute? No, we're it? just getting getting ready. <laughs> getting ready to dive in. Okay. Um, so. And are there versions 24, 27, 26, and 27? Is that why we're like focusing on No, we're, we're focusing on, as I tried to explain it, is like more, like think about it like as a, in the legislative process, you have, say, Senate Bill 100. And that's the base document. And people can come in and add, delete, you know, make, make amendments to, to change it. But it still stays Senate Bill 100. It's like the, you're in a serious version control <laughs> issue. So this is an attempt to, like, this is the base. This is where, this is our starting point. Um, and the starting point is, like, we, we all talked about about this, and there was been conversations for months about it. Um, but we are going to go through a process by which we uh, land on hopefully a version that the majority of the committee will recommend to the full board for. Um, but it'll be version 26 as amended and with the date. Okay, so that that will tell us like what the sticking. With the, I also want to say I didn't get I didn't I, I barely got to read through our documents and and this one particularly the, the amended um, I got it late this afternoon and I have full time job it's busy it's busy this week so I, I we're not going to take action any action on it today okay good and actually it's the same document pretty close to the same document that we had last time it's just in a different 
in a different format. In a different it's format. It's not the color coding. It's more of a listing out. Of right, because the, we did the color the coding. Um, again, uses the language by the Ministry of Directive. And I, um, last time we talked about getting clarity from the superintendent about what his intentions was, because another way you could do it is you could have a draft AD moving along so that people would be like, yeah, it's coming out of here, but it's going in here. And um, because the superintendent was there last the last meeting, um, we need to get clarity. Now we have clarity. It's like, and the clarity is it may or may not be there. So okay, we should just uh, ask them about that. Okay, um, any other questions on just the reset? All right, um, so I had, um, let's see, the preamble. Do you all want to present your thinking? Um, what I, I don't know if people had a chance to read it. It got um, posted today. I just, I just went through it. Um, what I've seen, I have some comments on, though. I guess just like, comments, I have a broad idea for like a coffee club, though. So we're starting at the national context, bringing it down to local, Oregon, Portland, and then down to the yes, what we've done in the last few years. And that is kind of like where our value is coming from. That's the most we can get. And then it goes into, with these values, here are the goals. First of the broad goals for the mission direction. And um, engagement has always been And a lot of the, I'd say about half the preamble, we took and edited a little bit from what was currently on there and then added the content. Um, I don't know, but I really love. Um, yeah, I, I just like how this on, um, again, the historical context. And also, it also allows us to really affect our community, which is, I think, the most important part of our policy. Okay. Um, Director or Michelle? Michelle is fine. So, um, oh, can, yes. I just, can I just say a oh, couple? Go ahead. Sorry. Just a couple of things. No, it's okay. Just a couple of things to contextualize. So, I think um, to uh, Tarsidan's points, really thinking about you know, we, we spent a lot of time discussing that, but the reason we're even having this discussion here at the school district uh, is really because, it's a, you know, we're really intentional about addressing systemic, uh, the systemic issues that have impacted uh, particularly communities of color. Uh, and so if you, as you look throughout the preamble, there's really an emphasis about uh, lifting up this, this idea about, uh, you know, listening, uh, taking uh, 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 action, uh, really being authentically uh, engaged with our communities of color uh, instead of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of lip service, if you will. And, and we, 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 uh, we, we provide a little bit of, of context in, in, this, in the sense that here in Portland, uh, you know, uh, community has uh, continuously for a long time, you know, had a spirit of environmental stewardship progressivism and activism and so really and, and you see that in many ways right whether uh and we highlight you know there's a lot of things we can highlight and you know director to pass love to hear your thoughts on this but you know one of the things that we highlighted was the the PSAF, um which uh which is i think one of the moments uh, in our city that we're proud of uh, as, a, as a citizen of portland because there was intentionality or, again around focusing uh, uh our communities of color uh and in, in, in that and so uh, using that to really then say, you know, as a school system, as a community, these values and these, this, this, this sense of, of, of progressivism towards communities of color is reflected in our graduates and in the graduate portrait. And so this is who we want to, uh, these are the types of characteristics that we want our students. Uh, and so, uh, and so it's again, if, if our students, it's similar to our, our, our overall vision, right, the connection between the graduate, the educator, the system, uh, and our values, in, in, in a similar way, this really tries to say, if this is who we want our, our graduates to be as a community, then, you know, and, and we kind of have an idea of what our educator, what we want in our educators, you know, uh, what we want in our system, now we're actually taking some actions around uh, the, the, the idea of place, right? And so taking a trip, and then that gets into some of the 
overall overarching goal. So I just kind of wanted to give a little bit more in terms of the thinking here. We're not married to any of this. Um, I think we've said that we knew that we were going to come here and, and part of the discussion. So, you know, at that point, send it back to you. Um, just today, I learned about it, um, an organization that's comprised of 40 uh, community based organizations um, on, on an effort called Heart Standards. And the, it's an acronym for Human Health, Equitable Energy, Anti Displacement. Reduction in carbon emission and resilience, and then the T is for in, in part is for temperature. That's where we talk about setting temperature standards for buildings, especially in low communities, affordable housing, subsidized housing. And um, what I really liked about this was that it was definitely led by communities of color, and that there uh, are 40 groups in Portland that we don't see in our public testimony stuff that are available, that are climate, climate scientists that are well-versed and that have lived experience in this. And um, that's, that's part of, part of my, um, my feedback has to say, I, I would love to see these frontline communities speaking for themselves, empowered to speak for themselves, and not having people use frontline communities as a little term all the time. Um, let's get those people empowered and in leadership positions so that they can speak to the impacts that are directly impacting their families. Um, and then my other thing was about the preamble. I don't know if this is the right thing to talk about it or not, but um, we do, the historical um, context is excellent. And I don't think we can talk about, it's like, where do you start the story? I think we need to start it like slavery is a foundational, like a building block of capitalism and um, income disparities and you know, where, we, we, where we are today and we're seeing as a result of income disparities and the, Host of other um, root cause issues. And so I think we need to talk about that because that is a root cause of climate change as well. Because people have been living here for thousands of years and never had climate change and now we have climate change. Yeah, and there's I, a straight the through line from slavery and the stealing of land in this country that is foundational to where we see ourselves. That's and, and I think that's why it's important to have those uh, voices of communities of color and frontline communities at the table because these are people who are experiencing the trauma of those things generations later. And I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge that and have those people at the table they, who can very articulately speak for themselves. Um, and, and also, um, there are some. Um, I'm just going to throw the Sierra Club out there because they're in the news, not now, but since the 70s and 40s were born, they have a, a history of bad practices and racism. I know that they've done things to address that, and I think that um, that's another thing about who we, who we choose to speak for these issues is, is really important. Uh, we want to hear from people talking about those that are in I think it's I think it's important. And again, that this is from skimming, not even reading the document. I'm just looking and, and seeing and my overall um, feedback has to do with who we are listening to, whose voices are we listening to. So it's not a criticism, it's just a it's a learning opportunity. Um, and, I, and I did I and it is just one sentence of acknowledging like capitalism, colonialism, and uh, and white supremacy. Climate change is look. Climate change didn't exist before you know people came over and stole yes. and everything else. Yeah. Um. But I would you know I think it would be good to maybe dive deeper into that. Um. Maybe not in this or maybe in this, but um. Just really acknowledge that it's because this. This affects those who are still harmed by action stuff uh, long ago. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's also this idea of um, I don't know if you're familiar with Howard Zinn and the people's history. It's like history has never really been told by the people that are the most impacted. They never it's always a victor, you know, in a war. And so, you know, just knowing that there's two sides to the story, and um, but I, I'd like I'd be I'd be very interested in hearing. Um, 
in, in presenting this document, in, in, in acknowledging that we understand that slavery is foundational to this, uh, where we are today, and we can't do anything about the past. We can certainly acknowledge that it happened and keep it's foundational for capitalism, factory building, stealing land to build factories, on all of that. So Michelle, when you, um, I don't think we maybe haven't done today or at this meeting, but if you have a, more time to um, look at it, uh, we'd welcome specific um, edits for you to um, run them by the, the group that um, did the original drafting. Yeah, and by the way, I think it's, I think, like, the student voice is also, you know, really, really important here. Um, and so I appreciate the effort you put into this, like, this is your future, and it's probably why a lot of us are here, so. Um, I think it, it does a good job of capturing that. I think it does. I think it, it, I think it does. If, if this is um, representative of the students in our buildings, um, particularly high school students, that makes me, um, I, I have, uh, I feel assured. Uh, that that we're that we're that we're in the right direction. Director um, Lowry or Ailey, do you have anything that with the preamble? Um, no, I I really appreciate that um, both Chief Garcia and Student Representative Weinberg worked on this, and I think it really, I think what we saw last night in the public comment was this um, passion and desire. Um, and uh, to, to really be serious about climate change. And I think this helps really articulate those values. I think it was Jackson that said that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the two overarching objectives are really helpful to have in there that it's about emissions reduction, um, that that's the goal by, um, I, I see it by 50% by 2030 and then reach net zero by 2040. And I love those goals. And then I, I think that um, I might actually rearrange the order of them and put that engagement, resilience, and wellness first. That you know, we are in the business of um, developing leaders as we look at our graduate portrait, and that yes, this is the climate crisis response policy, and yes, we need to make very, very practical changes to the way we do business um, because of the climate crisis. But I think the most important work we will do as a district is to prepare our leaders, our student leaders, um, to continue to lead on these um, subjects. So I, I think it's really impressive and um, I think it gives a great sense of um, direction for students and is very hope filled. Thank you. Um, so speaking, I'm glad you raised that, um, Ailey, because one of the things I was going to propose is um, a slightly different title that I think is more um, the captures, I think, what we're trying to do, which is climate, crisis, uh, climate crisis response climate justice and sustainability policy to capture like what we're trying to do. So it's um, it's more than just doing the scope one and, you know, getting um, a sort of um, you know, highest value things done, um, but it is way broader than that. I think you spoke to that um, last night. Which, um, so just kind of frame it up a little bit different. Um, Can you read the title? Sorry, I, um, I don't quite have it written down, but it was like climate crisis response, um, uh, climate justice, and sustainability. Um, climate justice and sustainability. Yeah, because I say the, the um, of course the the work around the emissions reduction is super important. But if all we do is like two big things that get us to net zero, I was like. That's great, but I do think how the policy becomes, how our work becomes sustainable is actually the work that we do with students, because they're going to be the ones when we're long gone. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to mention that word sustainability to sort of like professionals are like, should we use that word? Does that work mean something that we don't want it to be? And so we're kind of shifting to resilience. Um, it, it implies that there's uh, future generations that are that are to develop their resilience and ability to Friendly adapt. Amendment. Accepted. Yes, ability to adapt is a key um, skill in that case. To adapt to the temperature changes, adapt to the changing political climates. Um. So. 
I, I really liked it. There's a couple times there, there were a couple things that they're fairly minor, but they're more um I would just come up with a little bit. Uh, since it's a policy versus a resolution. But I think mean, we keep the spirit, but just more policy language versus like the resolution of language. Uh, but I'll send those that off to you guys and we can Okay, so um just the to wrap that one up, uh, Michelle, you're going to send some comments. Anybody else who has comments? Any other staff have anything they want to add? Would you guys like to work? Yes, yeah, I was just about to say, I'd love to. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And thank you again, uh, Jonathan, for working on that. Um, so, but I'd like to do, and Michelle, we're going to uh, work something in that didn't happen earlier. Um, but you had a set of comments where, which were on a separate document. This is the whole version control. Uh, that's what I was curious about. And um, in this, in the staff document, which is now the sort of amendments, the series of amendments, there are some um, comments around some of the things that you had. Um, my feelings will not be hurt, trust me. <laughs> okay. Um, we try to capture it in there and speak it Yeah, no, I, I, I'm always just always open for comments, criticism, feedback, positive debate. So what I so what I'd like to do today is um, right. Thank you for that spirit. So that will then cross one more document on my list <laughs> that's like out there. What version um, is that? So um, what I'd like to do for the next uh, fifty minutes is walk through um, the different goals. And I only, for the sake of um, ease, did it by, by goal, like just <laughs> one, but I mean, I think that there's some, sometimes there's things that are different things that are in each goal that may make sense to further bifurcate them, but um, that's how I did it. So don't be constrained by the form, but what I like, um, staff to do whoever's the appropriate and it may rotate is to kind of walk through each each section you've done a great job footnoting with a at a, at a super high level um why you've made a change but i think it's it's worth talking through them so that so that board members and community members can understand since we since we haven't had this discussion on, um in committee at this point in time or board meeting. Does that does that yeah. work? And yeah. Are we going off of the document the amend amendments proposed? Yes. Going line by line. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think that's a good way to walk through it and I'll just do kind of uh, a quick preface. Uh, when we had the, the color footed document uh, a couple okay. meetings ago, there was also a memo, a cover memo on that to kind of explain the intent of that. Uh, and then, so it gets into this a little bit, but I just kind of want to reiterate that you know, from a staff perspective, and something we had a conversation with Bob Lupe earlier today, is that uh, we feel we're very much aligned with the intent and the goals and the intended outcomes of the policy. And so, you know, from a staff perspective, we hope that ultimately you know, the board adopts a policy that is clear, that is bold, that is directive, that is accountable, that's actionable, that's measurable, uh, and, and, uh, and achievable. And so that is that is what our hope is. I think that's what everyone's hope is. And the proposed changes uh, we see they're they're not intended to dilute the seriousness or any of the goals. Really, they're intended to strengthen the out the intended outcomes by clarifying the language. So that's what we're trying to do here. And so like the comments that we've heard and that we heard last night, we are in really full agreement with all those comments, with all those sentiments, uh, and even the ones where there was some uh, some references to other documents or other policies. That struggled to implement because the language was vague or unactionable or maybe focused on specific actions versus intended outcomes. And so our hope was to try to just provide some additional opportunities for clarity. So that was really kind of the the impetus around providing these these recommendations. So I hope that's clear in the mayor. I think it's very well. Uh, so if it works, we'll walk through the document and we'll pick it in chunks. I think, yeah, and I'm going to just be a little bit of a time moderator because I want to get 
I want to get through this. Um, so I'll just ask everybody um, things that might be interesting to ask, but not necessary. Um, let's try and get to. Is there any intent to focus on where the questions are? I mean, we can walk through line by line, but board, board members may have specific questions I want to be sure we get to. Well, what I would suggest maybe is start going and go fast. And just like I, I want to hear the ration. I want to hear the rationale on all these. If we're going to be removing something um, that's been in the document for eight months. Um, and then if we want to go deeper, like, hey, I didn't understand what that meant or tell me more. Do that. Can I request that we start with some of the uh, other three items? Um, Laura has to leave a little bit early today. I want to make sure that she's available for questions um, on some of the more the OTL side. Okay, that, that works. Okay. Um, so what section is that? So amendment nine? So the pillar number three provide effective environmental and sustainable education. Uh, and goal 3.1 uh, just has a couple small changes. I love it. PPS one power. Keep your staff as allies for a healthy climate. So no change there. Staff, of course, agrees with the sentiment and the intent of that. Uh, but then there are some some suggested provisions from there. So our words make sense to just highlight that rationale. Yes. Sorry. So we're at amendment three, goal three point one. I just want to yes. Okay. Yes. Question. This relates to every single one of yours. How come you eliminated the words the district will? Because then what you have is just like it's. It, at least how I read it, I'm very literal. It's like it just seems like a random list. Um, so I, so when we looked at this document, uh, it was from the lens and how we were asked to look at the document as staff is the lens of uh, what is big picture policy, and then what would we put into our administrative directive. So when we looked at it, we believed we were again trying to. Uh, Assist the board in putting larger goals and measurable goals. So then we would have the like, what would staff do as a part of the potentially administrative directive? So that's when, again, looking at this, it was that idea that as a board, your larger big picture would be that we would empower all of our staff as allies for healthy climate and then talking about what we need to do as staff would look like um, providing learning opportunities on I just, I just want to make one clarifying point that yeah, I don't think staff thinks anything's discretionary. Staff doesn't get to pick and choose. So whether that language is in there or not, it isn't to, it isn't to signal some discretion to implement. Exactly. It was Actually, just, it was like a way more just sorry. basic like grammar question, like there's no verb. I, I, I think we're not focused on that level. Okay, but I was wondering if there was a reason you took it. You took it out. It was. At, it was. The draft had it partially out when this iteration was started, and so we made it consistent. It was, okay, that's all that. That's all that. Happened. I wasn't sure what it meant. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. So, so to clarify, like the bigger picture is that we would provide the learning opportunities for staff on climate justice and in, in climate science. Oh. And then uh, how the workflow that we see for ourselves is then around annual trainings, around um, developing a liaison in the school. So, so again, uh, it was more of a what is the big picture goal versus what is the implementation look like. So that's what um, these proposed uh, movements were made. Uh, to signify uh, the lens of policy versus the lens of the implementation plan. So we felt like that potentially the policy would provide learning opportunities, and then us as staff would do that through annual trainings, through uh, 
creating sustainability in the exact same sense. That, that makes sense to me that the list of activities in order to meet the goal don't need to be written out. But, and then the policy says we need to have a goal to meet, the strategies to meet the goal don't need to be in this document. That's so, what we're the activities that are required exactly. to meet. Because we actually might be limiting ourselves with like, oh, we'll train everybody, you know, once a year, we'll have an online training, you know, I think not listing out the activities allows this to be more expansive than adaptable. Exactly. So because the minute you have a train, the minute you have everything listed out, and then a year goes by, like, oh my gosh, we could have done this, this, and this too. So if you take out the annual training, though, I, I do think there's something in number two that's not reflected in number one. This one is learning opportunities. Like, check. The second, I say, take away the annual training. What I'm saying is that people are integrating sustainable practices in their work. I think the thinking is that it is embodied in the PPS will empower PPS staff as well. So that's so high level. I mean, it, you don't have to agree. I'm just saying yeah. that was the thing. We and that was the, the thing. It's exactly your words. We were trying to distinguish between high level what, and, and that was the lens we were using. What's high level? And then what should be in our uh, more detailed action plan implementation plan? So oh, that was the. No, please. You're, you um, the, city, the city of Portland um, wants every single employee to be responsible for uh, being anti racist. You know, like, how are you going to do that? You know, that's a big job. And so the policy is, you know, is, is what it is. It's up to the, the, at the bureau department level to put um, some goal in everyone's work. But that's not listed in the policy. The policy is just that, you know, value statements from the city become anti racist. And the activities are determined at the, at, at the staff level, people here level, should say. It's, a, it's in everybody's work. Now, some people have multiple trainings that they need to take, and others have two or three. I'm just talking about I think providing learning opportunities and training for staff on climate science and climate justice. This is like an optional training tool. It's not all trainings. We offer our staff just having that available for staff to take if they want to. And then in key jobs, like the ones named in here, where we want them, for sure, they could be things like that. Okay, keep going? Yep. Okay. So, so similar, so now I came down to number four and number five. And again, those were we'll see again through the lens, those seem to be implementation action items as opposed to larger uh, goal policy uh, levels of measuring levels that we, that we could then uh, put into our implementation plan. So increased capacity to me is like a larger, is a larger concept versus like a specific thing. So I think uh, one of the ways we increase capacity is through training and learning opportunities, is how we were understanding that. Right. I guess I'm thinking is like I, I think increased capacity is the big the big thing and then coming up with you know the implementation plan has like X, Y, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, so the footnote on that one actually says too big to be implemented and monitored. So that one wasn't specific to being um, an implementation tactic. So if you look up but which part is vague about it? Uh, like it's not defined what is it what is increased capacity mean? How do we measure that? How do we monitor that? What's the what's the goal? And and so what Aaron's saying I think how we like you're thinking about the picture is what was listed here. Provide learning opportunities is how, generally speaking, and it is we build capacity with providing those learning opportunities for that. So, that was.
actually really like the goal, and if it could be more specific, you know, I mean, I'd like to retain some aspect of we're giving resources to increase, we're giving more resources to schools and districts that be able to, at the community level, respond to these. So we are able to save our lives all could I, I couldn't hear all the like, rest of the next to the stand. What did you say about giving resources? I like I like the I like the goal and I understand that's a little too vague, but if you can make it more specific, would that allow it to still be a community policy, I guess. So something like you say provide resources to our or I guess or to I, I think the problem was increased opportunities for staff. That was just an example. I think increased capacity seems like that was the big part. So some measurable way to measure, I guess, capacity building. And so oftentimes we measure that through hours of professional development or uh, or types of training. And so I think that's where we um, and some of the might so it's not that it's big, it's not that it's big. Well, it depends what's well, meant, what it's meant by the term. I would assume it means something different because it's a separate item. So, but I, 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 I'm not saying that. <laughs> Question, Terry, are you? Will we pick up all of this discussion? Just think, I'm sure we're going to need to go back and watch it. Yes. As, if I can hear it here, they'll be able to hear it through there. So okay, there are, perfect. I do miss pieces here and there, but we go back to the recording. You can generally pull it up and hear what was said. Okay, because I'm by the fan too, and I'm having the same issue. It's like, okay, hopefully we can repeat this. I would recommend not reading the transcripts, though, because <laughs> that will make you crazy. Yeah. Um, so I'm, before we move to the next one, I would like to clarify, where's the footnote? I, I saw at the very top there's a footnote. I, I see the list. Oh, I see. Okay. So I want to just um, call it that I think number one and number two are two different things. Okay. Because what I do, one is like learning about the science and climate justice. The second is actually, what does that mean for me in my job? And um, I think I can get there, like the annual training is too specific. But I do think, how does this, how does something impact my job? And how do I, how do we incorporate sustainable practices in everybody's? Job, which is like a lot, a lot of large institutions are doing now because it's like everybody has the capacity to um, address climate. Most people do, either climate, like I can produce this paper or um, you know, a whole variety of things. Um, so I think that is like one of the things that I see is different between one and two. Just and I just want to reiterate, we're not arguing that that's important. Everything that you're saying, we agree with and we believe to be true. Well, what the distinguishing factors here is, uh, is it big picture enough to be policy or is it detailed enough to be an implementation action item? And that's the lens we use in the views. So I'm not arguing that the, the, yeah. the, yeah. the value of just anything like, you're saying, 100% agree with, we all 100% agree with that. It was just the clarity between, is it big picture policy or is it a detailed action item for our implementation plan. And that was the lens we used when looking at these. So it's not, we don't value it. It's that, oh, this is how we would do the bigger picture goal. Yeah, so I guess, um, and this is, it probably take longer the first one. So sorry, you're the first one. Um, but so for example, PPS will empower all PPS staff as allies for a healthy climate. To me, that's like, 100,000 foot level. It's like, great, I love the spirit of it, but it doesn't tell me that. It doesn't tell me, like, like from a policy perspective, like, what does that mean? And it, to me, it would be easy to maybe, like, sum it up, providing learning opportunities, 
and um, you know integrate uh, sustainable practices in like have people understand how they could integrate sustainable practices in their work without saying it's going to be a training or PD or you know whatever it is. So that's what I'm struggling with is like the goal is like way to. And so I think that's why we left number one, is that I, I think we agree with exactly what you're saying, and that there's that big picture goal, and then there's the how, uh, how your expectations as a board or a us will be to do this, but then to put it into action would be what we believed uh, read to be about. Well, one thing is this, the training is going to look very different depending on what you do for work. You know, whether you're in the kitchen and the mandatory food scraps are going to be coming soon within the spring time. Uh, well, everybody will be on, on notice. And versus white collar versus someone that works next to a printer, you know, versus, you know, so and, and, and all the practices that, you know, any, any organization of this size would have to, you know, put in place. They're so differentiated, I think, to spell everything out would be limiting, I think. Yeah, so uh, what I'm going to suggest through this process is there's going to be things that we may be like, yes, I totally agree with that. And things like, um, I agree with part of it, but the other part, I think there's a different way to phrase it, to capture it. So just to, to model that, I would say, I think I agree with you on saying it's an annual training. But what I may say is like, but I still think we should capture something about sustainable practices being integrated into people's work. Is that to me that's different than like learn, learning about climate science and climate justice. So I might propose something separate that is um, maybe an up level from annual training, but not a complete delete. And I think everybody on the committee should think of things that way. It's like, hey, I don't, yes, and maybe something else. So that's, that'll be the process. And this might be a question for our general counsel, but so thinking through, so, so you've been thinking about through like, again, trainings for staff or you know, just wanting to think through like our labor like labor implications here. It's noted in the it is so noted. Can, sorry, when you talk about training, like they have to bargain. Yeah, that bargain that, right. But I think when I'm, I don't know what the other board members think on the committee, but but the chair is saying we wouldn't say training because of that. We talk about other other ways to integrate it into the sustainable practices into everyone's work, right? And I think that's the. That's it's the effort of what's already happened here pre COVID and what was through this building. Right. So I think okay. I can I, I think that doesn't create a problem under the CBAs, present or future. Okay, I was gonna say I think this first one is a little bit harder just like to get used to like how we think about it. So it's not like yes or no, it's you know, what do we think about that? It's like yes, sort of, or both and yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, are you ready to talk about Amendment 10? Or, everybody else ready to go to 10? Yes. Using, again, the, the lens that we used was, all of this is very important. Which of this should be high-level policy, and which of this should be how we will make the high-level policy go into action? And so that's... Um, what you see here is, again, we completely agree with the goal, right, with guidance from our frontline students and communities. PPS will develop curricular learning opportunities so that our graduates know the causes and consequences of climate change, understand climate justice, and have the opportunities to practice climate solutions so that, um, to use your words, Director Brim Edwards is the 10,000 foot, and then how we will do that is by developing and delivering curriculum and resources to help our students understand, prepare for, and respond to climate change impacts and climate justice, prioritizing our schools that are serving our frontline communities. And then how we'll make that happen with the very tangible specifics for the implementation of that action is 
we are going to integrate climate justice into our curriculum. We're going to use the integrative approaches. We're going to offer climate justice learning opportunities that are culturally relevant. So again, these are the ways that in our detailed implementation plan, we would ensure that we're developing curriculum resources to help our students to meet that larger goal that all of our students will graduate knowing the causes violence of climate change. So that was the lens we used with these suggestions. Aurora, I think you, this is Director Constam, um, I think you threaded that needle very well in terms of um, making a commitment to our policy level goals and being really clear what the roles and responsibilities of staff are to, to meeting those goals and to empowering our students. Thank you, Director Constantine. So one of the things that you have eliminated, the suggestion for deletion is um, offer climate justice learning opportunities that are culturally relevant and solutions focused. And it's the, the footnote says redundant of number one with modified text. And I read that a little bit differently. Um, one is how you're going to do it is going to be with guidance, and then which is different from actually offering it. So to me, I guess I'm. I'm not seeing it necessarily as so when we develop or right, that's create and then we deliver that's when we uh, provide or give the students the lesson or um, uh, integrate students into the lesson so that is how we read offer the learning opportunities was through that curriculum that we would be providing to the students. So if you, so that is how we looked at it, that offering was uh, us providing uh, the curriculum or providing those learning opportunities. And a lot of those things are uh, synonyms, synonyms in our edgy speak oftentimes. So that's, that's how we lumped those ideas. You could take our culturally relevant and solution focused and put it um, number one, develop and deliver curriculum and resources that are culturally relevant and solution focused. Absolutely. Yeah, and then, um, but if we do that, do you do that? My question is because we have Black and Indigenous other people to like cross out, like if we are creating a culturally relevant. Um, curriculum, it should be guided through those. Uh, Danny, and that, this is simply, I think, no one was intending to limit BIPOC, eliminate BIPOC communities at all. It was, uh, I think, my understanding of using frontline communities that included and is defined as broad or including BIPOC, but the frontline communities is broader than just BIPOC. And so it was using frontline communities as the definition but it was not, I want to be super clear, never intended to um, dilute that and, we, and make that change. We were responding to the feedback from the last committee about that definition. And I'll, I'll add to, we, we added that in the glossary, um, the definition of the nine communities, which defines. You know, if you go to any other city in this country and you say, I'm BIPOC, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Nobody else, BIPOC people don't like being called BIPOC. It's not used anywhere else. You have to come to Portland to become my pocket. You're not, you're not okay. Once you're here, it's my pocket. It's really a thing. Um, it's a very Portland centric term. Anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. I thought it was being used around. Any other questions or anything else you want to share on 3.2? information around uh, resolution. Sorry, Aaron, remind me the resolution around uh, teaching the curriculum. And uh, 
Sorry. 5272. 5272. So we also looked at the language around resolution 5272 around providing curriculum uh, around time justice to students. So so we also felt that there there is a, a resolution that also supports this idea around us. Uh, providing these learning opportunities. They're in alignment, though, right? Okay. Absolutely in alignment. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, at, uh, in our community, in the ideas here around us providing that curriculum would be um, lost between the, the big picture goal and the uh, action. So, are we moving to amendment number 11? Is that you too? Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so again, with, through the lens of uh, policy and then implementing uh, the, the big picture goal was that PBS staff will collaborate with students to create opportunities to engage youth in hands-on climate learning, preparation, and practice on a regular basis at all PBS schools. And so then again, the how we would do that would be to support the development of youth leadership and engagement opportunities around climate solutions, as well as treat the grounds and garden of each school as a learning space, so, um, and support opportunities uh, for every, as a, sorry. So we change the gardens to be uh, out, designated outdoor learning spaces is our recommendation. Um, so that, so those would be the two halves. So, Support the youth leadership and engagement, as well as support opportunities for students in every elementary school to learn in the designated outdoor learning space. Uh, and so then again, how we would um, create opportunities to then support that directive from the board around providing youth leadership and engagement. We would um, create meaningful opportunities with our BIPOC students. We would uh, support the student-led initiatives and student-led advocacy groups, um, support leaders in the, and our student leaders as well. So those, I think, are varying levels of how we would ensure that the board's goal and outcome of supporting youth leadership and designing the outdoor learning systems. I guess I, I'm unclear on number three that you didn't admit, and it's the note says support is undefined when number one says support. Uh, and it, it seems like I heard you just almost say this full sentence, that's going to be in there, and, but then it's deleted. Or it, it's deleted because it's could lead to unanticipated consequences. So again, I think as we were having a conversation around if we're supporting the development of the youth leadership and youth engagement opportunities, then uh, I, I, again, it was yeah. To me, it's like an, it's that, almost like you put it the same thing in the sentence, like we're going to support the development of the of youth leadership and the engagement opportunities and the student led work. Is, I mean, that, that's kind of like, to me, number three is like, after you've done that, and then the students are actually leading the work, it's the district supporting them. So to me, it's it seems like it's just a part of number one. And I think we could, uh, as you suggested earlier, just take some of that language from number three and add it to be more clear in your directive. Yeah, I think the language in number three, uh, youth led climate organizations, because the, our students and PPS have created hundreds and yeah. hundreds of youth led organizations. Um, and they're doing this work outside of school assembly. And I think our goal should bring, should, our goal should be able to bring that work inside of us. I love the, um, the outdoor learning spaces. It's really, really great. Even, you know, even City Hall has a demonstration there. It is work that our people mix it was not the last of the crazy. It's certainly on the 
a great it's a great learning learning environment to be hosted. So I want to be cognizant of the time. Um, anything else? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, just from the thinking, so moving forward, are you the designated? Um, <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> advice of counsel, be careful how you answer. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, you know, as, like, there's some things that we're like, yeah, maybe there's like a smush together. Like, are you the person? I mean, I know you're the coordinator. I'm happy to be the smusher. Yeah. <laughs> because, like I said, I think sometimes we get too caught up and like attached to our language. And like, if we have common goals, like sometimes the smush together is gonna be what um, captures both of the goals. So I'm just and I'm, I'm happy to work with this committee or a smaller committee to help uh, smush and merge <laughs> and uh, combine some of that language to, to meet that common goal. Again, we agree with everything in this document. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to move to the, the top? That was very artful how you let her do the first one that was <laughs> like the. <laughs> Aaron, I, I just knew she had to leave. I was trying to. You know. <laughs> okay. And so just being cognizant of the time, um, we'll move through and ask clarifying questions. Go ahead. Okay, so I'll preface this with just saying kind of the same thing Aurora did is the intent was to kind of separate the high level, what we think is high level policy language versus what is implementation language. Um, so goal 1.1, um, we're leaving the same with, with goal PPS will design, construct, and operate new low carbon, high performance schools and renovations that are energy efficient, resilient, and adaptable. So that's already a pretty descriptive goal. A lot of the uh, um, numbers under here that we proposed to remove um, were kind of redundant based on um, what the what the bold goal is already talking about. So uh, that was the reasoning for the majority of these on why we proposed to remove them. They're redundant. Um, and they're just you know more specific examples of of what is already being said in goal one point. So one comment I would have is the blue cross out section is provide a community respite during climate related emergencies. I think we heard from a um, coalition of communities of color that part of the water policy was to have um, PPS be a beacon for its power outages, severe storms. We would be a gathering place for community to be able to sort of support community in the inevitable disasters that we're missing. So right. I'm not tied to this language, but some aspect that speaks. Yeah, I hear you, and I, I'll say once again, I don't disagree with this language. Um, it does say, you know, in goal 1.1, um, renovations that are energy efficient, resilient, and adaptable. So to us, that is covered in that. And then, and then like I said before, uh, number four is more of a specific implementation measure. Not that we disagree with it. Is there any reason why number one doesn't have in, um to maximize the use of renewable energy sources as long as we're putting where feasible yeah to me i something like that i mean it also just seems strange to be talking about energy efficiency but not talking about that we want to minimize fossil fuels use of fossil fuels i mean um was, was there an issue with the policy language on that one or oh. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm not recalling what the specific. Um, we do have other admission. Oh, okay. We're so, going down to 1.2 and 1.3. Uh, okay, yeah. Minimize the indirect use of fossil fuels. To me, that means minimizing the electricity use that we, or the fossil fuels that the electric electric companies generate, right? By us purchasing electricity from them. You're calling out indirect fossil fuels, right? That's not something the district can control. We can't. The utilities have goals to, you know, clean up their grid and and and, and uh, move away from fossil fuel generation uh, and deliver more clean energy. But we can't. Control, we can't control the indirect use of. And they're going better. They are. Yeah. But 
also, what about gas? That's just electric utilities. We always got gas. Gas is a direct use of fossil fuel for the district. So is it the word indirect that you're objecting to? Yeah. We just remove indirect and minimize fossil fuels. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? I said, yeah. Remove indirect. Yeah, you remove indirect. Because in the, the, the rationale is that is something PPS can't control. Correct. We can't stop using energy. Um, we can't control. You know, we can control <laughs> moving away from directly burning our scope one emissions, but our scope two emissions, which is our purchase electricity. Um, our goal is to electrify our buildings and our fleet. As part of the policy, and you can't control the speed in which a utility may or may not decarbonize. Um, they they have stated that they have goals to do so, uh, but it's not under our purview to do that. So I also that so just in that one sentence, like increase energy efficiency, I like the maximize renewables because I think that's that's a high level policy statement. It's not like go buy X amount of solar or whatever. And then um, also the reference to the fossil fuels. So add maximize to one, add maximize. Yeah, I'm not seeing maximize renewables. Maximize the use of renewable energy sources. So one. Um, is that something we're, we're being asked to add? Well, is, I that, think, is that in place of decreased energy efficiency? Is that? I think that is like a separate thing because there are different ways you can increase energy efficiency that don't have anything to do with maximizing renewables. It's well, those are two separate things. There's two, yeah, they, they would be separate. But I, I'm just saying, I don't, in the document I'm looking at in front of me, I don't see the, the term maximize renewables. I'm just quoting my colleague. Oh. Yeah, I was, okay. I was suggesting it as an addition. Okay, so I energy, think you know, getting to energy efficiency is one thing, and then also maximizing the use. You can do both at the same time if you want to get to hit your goals. Right. right. And minimizing fossil fuels. To me, those are like the three yeah. Okay, I want to keep keep moving. Is there anything else that you feel is noteworthy about? Um, I want to note that Jackson called out uh, number four, so maybe there's some language there. Um, Okay, number five, you know, it's just, uh, this is the issue that students have brought to us over and over again. Right. Um, and we could operate low carbon, high performance schools and actually do nothing about the having sustainable practices and actual nutrition. Right. So we, Footnote says this is an implementation tactic. Not that we don't agree with it, we just don't see it as being policy language. I'm just going to put a pin in that. Just, um, I think that's again, you spoke to this last meeting. It's like, it's a very tangible way in which our students. Um, I think interact and start understanding sort of like sustainable practices um, because it's very tangible to their life. What does infrastructure mean? Um, this is not to be too detailed, <laughs> but it could be a whole host of things. What um, you're getting single single use, having um, uh, having I, I think we, I think we better serve our students by helping educate them about what are the most impactful things that each of us individually can do. So I think there's this tension between what, what we think are the most sustainable practices and what actually make a difference for climate justice. And so I think sometimes there are things in the policy that, that we do hear from students or we do hear from others that they would like to see and my question is this balance between people feeling like the policy is having an impact and, and actually having an impact, not to say that the things that people desire don't always have an impact, but I want us to, to again, you know, if our goal is to help really sustain those leaders for the future, um, 
to make sure we're being really clear about why we're doing what we're doing. And if it's to make, to make it look like we're doing something, and I don't think that's what you were saying, Julia, but I do want us to be cautious about, um, I, and this goes back to some of the things we talked about last meeting, like about single use plastics. And I, I think Director Ben Edwards, you were the one that said that sometimes the actual energy used to make the other items is worse than the single use plastics. So stopping the single use plastics means we're not having the plastics in the oceans, which is excellent. And, you know, we were talking about the carbon footprint and the, the life impact of an object. And so I think how do we continue to wrestle with that and have conversations with our students and really be leaders on the complexity of what it means to really live um, responsive to climate change. Um, because I think as with many things, I'm going to be all, you know, conspiracy theory over here. But, um, you know, I remember when recycling was going to save us, right? When I was in high school, if we just recycled and cleaned the streams, our world would be fine. Um, and we know that that's not actually true. And so I think there, there sometimes is a tendency, um, instead of making the radical lifestyle changes we actually have to make to go for the low hanging fruit that, that um, seems like the solution. And I'll just say, you know, I think that industries like gas and oil and others are, are really masterful at distracting us from the actual underlying problems. So that's my conspiracy theory rant for the day. And then we can move on. Yeah, no, we, we, actually, uh, we have a, a concrete example. Um, recently had a, um, you know, Ringwell come to Portland and um, offer to take all the things that you can't recycle curbside. How cool is that? You know, everybody got a box on their porch. Um, what that has, what the impact is, is it allows you to buy more things on Amazon because you can just put it on your porch, it goes away. It's, it's not regulated, um, it's been capital about, I mean, there's a lot of, it allows us to be um, it's like conspicuous consumers. It, it allows you to buy stuff in plastic without even worrying about it. So you just put it on the porch, it'll go away. You know, in other words, I think to Director Lowry's point, um, we have to be very conscious of everything we do and it's, and it's trade-offs, you know, it, it's environmental trade-offs. So it's great that we can recycle styrofoam, but we should try to not purchase styrofoam. Yeah, well, I guess it's I guess plastic. So, and it's, the term is embedded energy, it's the energy that goes in, the resources that go into making the product. And I, think, I like that term, Michelle, thank you for teaching that to me today, embedded energy. And, and then it's the, the whole life cycle of a single-use plastic because that is used, there's some utility there, but then the end of life, you know, you have to landfill it or whatever. I think we can hold both um, things to be truths. And what I'm concerned about is that this is why I wanted to change the title a little bit, because otherwise you do scope one and scope two, and it's like, hey, just the, oh, we have to get our buildings better and transportation, and we will make huge cuts. But if we're still carting out trash every day, that it's single use, because we decided that was low value, you know, I think we will not be doing the right thing. I mean, just my own opinion, we will not be doing the right things. Like we should try, we, there's gonna be big things in certain areas, but there's also gonna be other things that we need to do. And besides a lot of those products, have how much amount of things that PPS buys and consumes and our students consume, a lot of those are coming across the ocean <laughs> and, you know, very, you know, the transportation sector, it's not just our buses, all that stuff's coming here um, on freighters being offloaded in the, you know, LA and Long Beach and then being chucked up here. Um, so I think we need to do what we need to do. Um, and I guess I'm concerned if the, the thing that students feel they can do it's like some people are like, hey, just you know, dry your clothes on, I'm not the dryer, but not hang in line. That's like one thing you can do. It's like also we're trying to build leaders and students and having it be like, don't be completely overwhelmed by this massive thing that's gonna happen to you in life and climate change, you know, happens. Um, but there are some things you can do. I think that's one way for students to see it. So I don't I don't wanna lose the students having like it's part of their responsibility too. Yeah, my, my one question I think this would be for the staff. Do we have data on, like, can we, because I know my elementary school did use metal forks at one time. I don't know if they still do, but 
Um, but like, can we compare the data on right to carbon emission for for ten years compared to you know using a plastic for for ten years? Right. Um, I know other cities have done that. Yeah, our emission services department has done that in the past. And we have that data with that analysis. The, the issue is not that we don't want to do it, it's that there, there are some barriers, there are some other issues. We, we rolled out, for instance, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll just say this quickly. We rolled out a program where we were doing um, durables at school and we found that they were being thrown away on accident. And at that point, it's actually a bigger carbon impact if you're throwing away durables that you aren't throwing away on single use. Plus so um, there, there's some it's very nuanced issue. We're not, it's not that we're not committed to it. Um, like I said before, we're, we're in agreement with, with the sentiment. We just need to make sure that we have the right things in the implementation. Um, and our administration services department, I work with them closely. They're, they're very committed to this work. It's just, just a, a lot of factors that go into making sure that we can do it successfully. And part of that is upgrading a lot of our kitchens to production kitchens, which we don't have. So. Um, a lot of our kitchens already have dishwashers, so so that's just uh, an example of one of the biggest barriers. Uh, but in the interest of time, I think. So because but just really, just because there isn't dishwashers that weren't run us through that, so we, we wouldn't be able to. You can't wash the floors. Um, yeah, there's not a dishwasher. There's not capacity for a dishwasher. There isn't one that exists in the kitchen. Just an example. In upgrading all of our kitchens renovations can have significant costs and that is just one example of uh, designing constructing and operating these high performance buildings so it's one of hundreds of things that then embedded in the policy appears to be the priority for the other things that we might do high impact that's why we have some challenges with that that level of detail or it directs to to install <coughs> infrastructure during renovations i'm going to point out again i think in the unless it disappeared in the preamble, that we say very explicitly that we're not expecting everything to happen all at once, and we're expecting staff to go after the highest leverage ones. Um, but again, to try and be, to, to acknowledge that, yeah, and, and also give some space, but also to acknowledge, I mean, I just... It does like the question, what's the value of having something in the policy? It's not discretionary, but it's in the policy for staff to follow. If it's then contradiction with the overarching, go after the higher return on the Well, here, here's what I'd say is I think for our students, that's the most obvious thing that gets thrown away and wasted every day. So, directly? Like, you walk through, like, they're, um, like the lack of recycling or reusing. I mean, it, it's just, it's something, like, we're a huge consumer. And there, you know, if this, if, Works on the end of it. I'm not going to fight the world over it. But if that is data that we can provide and compare it, if it turns out, hey, that plastic forks aren't like a super waste, then like. So, yeah, that's part of what we would do, right? If the policy gets passed, we do an analysis of our carbon emissions. But can, can we already do we have data before? Can, can you bring up an historical thing you worked yeah, on? Can, can ask, not, not on the spot here, but right. can you yeah. circulate that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I we have limited time left, and so um, go. Okay. Sorry, I'm just taking some quick notes. Too. That's okay. And Terry confirms us we can watch the video. Okay, Amendment Three. Um, so the overall goal: PPS will maximize reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from district operations, maintenance, and facilities management. Um, we are proposing to keep number, the majority of number two established standardized waste systems for waste prevention practices. We deleted the rest because it was um, very specific and we agreed that, or we proposed that, that that's more of an implementation tactic. The other two we feel are redundant in other um, areas of the policy. Uh, maximize efficiency and fuel, we already talked about that in, in goal 1.1. And number three, minimize disposable materials and fully utilizable materials before disposal. Um, we felt that that was redundant as well with the overall goal. How is um, water? 
fuel, electricity, um, redundant to greenhouse gas. Because um, by using those, we are creating greenhouse gas emissions. So we just feel that this is a more specific example of you know, we're, we're being told by policy to maximize greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we agree that we will do that by implementing efficiency projects, amongst other things. Um, but we felt that it was redundant and so this is water the specific question Julia. Thank so, you. Yeah, so how how does water affect greenhouse gas emissions with food? Well, it depends on how we're, we're uh, looking at water use. So um, it doesn't it's still it's still one or two. It's no impact. Um, but there is, you know, a big carbon impact with the treatment of water, but that's not in direct scope of the district. So, so it may not be it may not be real, it may not line up with four one point two. Right. Yeah, so I'm I'll just put a pin on that. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the whole thing. I didn't know you were talking about water use specifically. Uh, we don't have time to go through it right now, but I, I want to explore that more because to me I am looking for the redundancy and I don't elsewhere and I don't see it. But let's keep moving. It's an aerator increase, increase low flow toilets everywhere and aerated. Go one point one point one. Oh. Is increase in efficiency. <laughs> Go one point one number one increase energy efficiency. Do we have that in there? Um, yeah. Can, can we keep, just keep going? Sorry. Oh. I just want to keep going. It's fine. Like, yeah. That was, that was what I was trying to say. Um, okay. Amendment number four. Uh, Go one point three. PBS will maximize the carbon sequestration potential. And other environmental benefits of grounds and increase the ability of grounds to adapt to climate extremes. Um, sorry. Hemp farms. Sorry. Hemp farms. <laughs> uh, so we believe that this is more of the same feedback. We just believe that a lot of these are specific and they're more implementation tactics than they are policy on pitch. Uh, so you you would keep the maximize on on start. On site stormwater management, which has, yeah, which is already city code. It's already, I was going to say, yeah, we already have to do that. So, tree canopy is a huge equity issue. Uh, if you look at the New York Times, has even had Portland in it of like all these trees on the west side. Sorry, I didn't know Southeast Portland for um, And on the on the east side, you have these huge heat deserts because um, of lack of trees. So I'm not sure I would. Again, I'm not really, this is a further point, but like that maximizing carbon sequestration, that that covers increasing shade trees or these other, or like reducing. The heat islands. I believe that the, if we're doing new construction, I think there is a tree requirement. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we don't disagree with it. Um, it's just more of an implementation measure, we feel, than it is policy. Yeah, but what I'm saying is I don't see that it reflected in maybe a, just a language modification. Um, because we do have, in many places, we're the only open space that's not like paved over. And if we have everything paved over and we haven't maximized canopy, it's a stop. Um, and then number six, I'm just going to say that I agree with that. It's, it's another policy in way more detail. Number five. Number five. Uh, for 1.4, PPS will minimize greenhouse gas emissions from student staff transportation, including transitioning to electric or low emission vehicles. Um, so we added that in there just to be more clear as the overarching goal, that last piece. Um, and then 
you know, we're keeping in the goal of transitioning to our electric fleet by 2050. And then we added the, the caveats that, that were asked of us to add um, that we discussed uh, a couple of meetings ago. Uh, that's number three. And then the rest of them, for similar reasons, are being proposed to uh, be taken out of the policy. Um, I can cover specifics number two. I mean, we already offer time on passive by high school students. And we've got four minutes, so I think you better like do five I, level first. Yeah, I think that. Um, yeah. I, unless, unless the committee members have. I'll take specific questions if you have them. Okay. Keep going. That might be the best. I'm good with the number. Yeah. Okay. So, why don't you go to six? Okay. Goal 1.5 UPS will reduce the demand for new materials and resources and procure materials, products, and services in a manner that integrates climate considerations, fiscal responsibility, and equity problems. Um, so, we do agree with you know many best practices for environmentally comfortable purchasing, but we're just um, you know, we don't want it to be so detailed that we're analyzing every single um, purchase here. So this is, uh, we agree at the high level thought of it, but not for every single purchase. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the really hard subject matter expert. Environmentally preferable purchasing is a, it's a thing, right? It's not, it's a standard recognized thing. Right. Some places call it a sustainable purchasing policy, but one thing that we could do is um, just add a checkbox, um, like they do at city council. It's you know where we would have a financial impact. It could be what are the climate impacts. So the person purchasing would have to like go through the thinking process of having considered the right. And the feedback from our purchasing department on this was that they they have no problems you know, making that available, that information available, but we don't want to be making um, wholesale right we don't want to be saying you have to buy this and it's going to cost you more so that was the that was the reasoning behind that. any questions on goal 1.5 i think i just need to think about increasing electrification just because what access to the technology isn't equal across our district so our ability to like, encourage that is Right, we leave that at, at the department level or school level to decide that. So, okay, amendment number seven. Goal 2.1, PPS will address climate-based impacts on, healthies, on health, safety, and wellness of the students and employees. Uh, so we are including number one, Climate change impacts such as flooding, landslides, and wildfires, wildfires as risks in district real property assessment and assessment and management. Um, so we're okay leaving with that one, and we're taking on number two. Any questions on that? Sorry, number two, three, and four. Is the four where it says less carbon consists of cost of two? I believe so. Yes. What was the question, Jack? Two point one number four. Um, the less carbon intensive language you couldn't get across. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Right, it's supposed to be a standalone. I think there was a way. There was something about the footnote. Like, well, we couldn't. We deleted the footnote. I'm sorry, are you not, are you not proposing deleting them? No, no, I think it is proposed to be deleted. It just is showing up. Just like another place where this is, will not be captured in scope two. I mean, we're one of the largest food service providers. That's a scope, that's a scope three item. Upstream, downstream from the district. Um, also. So we're okay with something shipped from Omaha. Our, versus... our nutrition services department does have does buy local food, and they do have um, they do have uh, measures in place for that. I, I believe there's also a statewide um, uh, there's a statewide purchasing rule that encourages public agencies to purchase 
do with the 15 miles square possible. Well, I think we should. Get I don't know how I know that, but it, I ran up against it one time. And it was a. It, it's a. They. Uh, it allows for you to pay a little bit more money for your for local um, produce, for instance. Ironic. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it's more expensive. I just want to put a plug in too that that we would want Whitney here if there were specific language that impacted the USDA program. And the federal food program has other rules that I. Right enough to know or just know enough to be dangerous about. So we need that expertise to get close to. I'd like some data because to, to me, this is like another place where, again, our students, we don't want this to be like, hey, nobody has to worry about it because OSM and transportation are going to take care of everything. Um, again, PBS is just a major consumer of. What's the, so you want data on four? On four? What's so, the data you want? Julia? Well, okay, if we are buying locally, that's that's one thing. But the, the, just to think of like, hey, that's scope three. We don't have to worry about it. Um, so well, I think Aaron said we buy a lot of our food locally. And Do you want to know how much? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Or like, we already have. Her. Policy or practice around that. Um, Maybe we can have Whitney come um, to next week. Next. Again, I'm looking at like high, high volume things. Julia? Yeah? It's 553. Yep. And we're on, we have one last one to go. And okay. we have, well, I know you have other places to be, and we have public comments. So I just was. Okay. Trying to <laughs> time. Yeah, well, I have my son's engagement to go. So. Oh. I, <laughs> Congratulations. It happened. Um, so if we just get, uh, go through number eight and then we have one public comment and we have, oh, I so actually, I, I did not know that, um, I wrote that passed before the meeting to sign up if it's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. We'll, we'll get it done. Um, okay. Go on 2.2. Uh, PPS will support frontline student communities to build resiliency from climate change, induce stresses, and support preparation for and recovery from these events. Um, so we're leaving in number two, develop district-wide plans for how to communicate available local resources and help to support students and families during natural disasters such as wildfires, flooding, drought, heat waves, extreme winter storms, extreme wind events, and others. So our thought process here was partnering with, as we talked about in the previous meeting, partnering with the county and other organizations that we can help get these resources to our, to our communities. Um, and number three, incorporate climate justice priorities and climate resiliency designed to inform long-term facility planning. Plans should prior, prioritize serving people with disabilities and frontline Can I have a question on one being problem? You have a specific question you just asked? Oh, just, just okay. like the rationale. Um. I think generally, as I understood the team, and I'm in the interest of time, and there have been a lot of conversations, there's concern about wanting to be a strong partner in the in responding and supporting uh, and responding and building through events and building resilience and all the things, but also recognizing what people are still work with and not being too far away from that. I think we were, the language is attempting to find that balance. So it's not a lack of interest in supporting, but it's also recognizing that PPS will go so far and it's less effective the far away from the location. It also says we have a separate policy that we Emergency. And that's, so maybe, um, that's maybe, kind of a county, can you, we're following the county. Can you survive that policy? Yeah, just, I mean, with the emergency plan. What, whatever, is your, zero, whatever it is that you're zero. referencing. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Can I was just asking you to have a policy. It's 556. Um, okay. So, we have public comment, but before 
We have that. I had one other item on the agenda just on the foundation fundraising. Um, and just an update that uh, Chief Garcia and I had a conversation about the data and looking at where the leverage points were. Um, where the leverage point and the, the big inequities in fundraising and how that impacted schools and instead of approaching it like how do we control this group or do do X that we look at where are the leverage points, whether it's capital investments, buying FTE, um, and that was the high value way for us to look at how to create more equity in fundraising. So those are ongoing discussions. We need some new data. Um, we also talked about not having a cliff um, that everybody just falls off of. Um, and that bless you. Something that's really important to some of the school communities that currently have it. Um, but if you if you look at the data, actually from 1920, only let's see, 17 schools. Um, actually, 19, 1920. 2020. Those are that was a good year. I mean, you said you've been here for a century. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't mean it though. 2019, 20. 2019, okay. Um, only 17 schools have raised, have by more than 0.75 FTE, and so maybe there's a lower floor or a ceiling that's set, um, and then we have a lower clip. So, anyway, ongoing discussions, um, but we have to bring something and get people's thinking about values, um, about how we create more equitable parent and business and community fundraising around our schools so i thought we had disabled this last time i thought we had put it off like everybody i what i recall about the conversation is that we were like no that it's important but no it's it's so it's still going on just like the rescissions you know like the rescission is the most important thing no but we're still doing them so jonathan and i are having a conversation about how we can uh look at Fundraising in its totality. So I'm just giving you an update. I think it's a great thing to focus on. It's definitely an area where we see a lot of equity of uh, inequities surface. I it, it I just wonder if we can actually do it. it. Seems like a lot of a big body of work that we want to get right rather than getting it right now. Well, again, be a, be a believer. So Jonathan and I that think there's a path around. to some common ground. So um, we'll bring it. And I say, if I had to choose, I'd rather do that than rescission. So. We're going to try Maybe to do that. that's a trade off conversation that we should yep. have about everything that's on the table. So that's just an update. Okay. We're not asking anybody to vote on it. And like I say, you're trying to find some common, common ground. Um, so that, they will be presented. Yeah. Do we like have a policy? Yeah. Uh -huh. So they, they don't, they're still trying to get the 21 22 data. Um, anyway, it was a uh, productive conversation. With that, um, Ms. Bradshaw, who do we have for public comment? Um, Jane Como. My name is Jane Como. I'm a PPS parent. Um, I appreciate having a proposed change to the climate crisis response policy. It's really presented tonight. It's helpful. Um, I would characterize the changes as getting policy. Over the past year, in committee, earlier versions were discussed with the web and not the how in mind. And I, I wonder if version 23 was a non-starter, why was it taken out for public comment? I think significant damage has been done by setting students and the broader community's expectations about this work. As stated in my email to the board earlier today, it's not for lack of understanding about the difference between policy, ABs, and implementation plans. It's a desire to maximize public accountability and therefore best position this work for success. But I want to see more detail than what was in some of these proposed amendments. Expansive and adaptable documents could be interpreted as lots of wiggle room, and I want to know what is PPS going to do to ensure accountability of this policy? How are you going to measure success? How is implementation of this policy going to be different and spur more action and change compared to previous policies? Um, and I'll end on a positive note with two things. One, I like the idea of emphasizing resilience and student leadership. We know that action is a strong antidote to despair over the future of our planet. And 
I also just wanted to flag on a practical matter that the Federal Infrastructure and Investment Act has dollars carved out for public schools making efficiency improvements. It's called the Grants for Energy Efficiency Improvements and Renewable Energy at Public Schools, and it authorizes uh, $500 million for the Secretary to award competitive grants to public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sitting through the meeting. Hi, my name is Mike Rosen. First, I'd like to ask that the letter sent yesterday to the district by the eight statewide environmental groups be submitted into the record. I'd like to spend the rest of the room, my remaining time today providing a civics lesson to board, to board members because I think some, not all, lack an understanding of how policy works. It's unfortunate that some board members would be here to hear this. First, policy is defined as a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by its government. Version 25 of the CCRP is nothing like this. The issue at hand is the component administrative directive, essentially the rules the policy will follow. No other level of government I know of, local, state, or federal, writes rules in secret to keep the case. They, to an entity, fully engage stakeholders in the public rulemaking process. Of course, this is much easier for PPS if the company shuts out the community from engagement and leaves the community with little recourse once the engagement. For this reason, it is essential that the goals and strategies of the policy are robust, clear, and rock solid. This is and has been what the community has advocated for over the last two years. We understand that the board can't dictate what is, is or isn't AD. And so we've consistently questioned and challenged the refrain the staff and board members attempt to vet the policy that we did not worry because it will be included in it. That is what board members don't understand. It is, this is not their purview. That is why we object strongly to these proposed changes. So where are we now? Student Board Representative Jackson Longberg last night summed it up succinctly. It is time for us to tackle these problems with creative out-of-the-box solution for the district for rights itself. I appreciate the thoroughness of this policy, but at some point, we continue to rehash the same questions that our student and future students can't wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any further? Thank you, Mike. Oh, no, I just said Okay. Um, and then, Mr. Bradshaw, if you can just circulate that letter so they can be able to have it, that'd be great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.